Thank you, everyone. My name is uh, Mike Weiss. I am the AVP of Product Management at NASDAQ on the Intelligence Platform. And today I'm here to talk to you a little bit about how we have applied data observability with Monte Carlo to improve our data quality overall. So just to lay out a little bit of an agenda here, give you a little bit of an introduction to NASDAQ before we get into what you're really here to talk about, which is what we've done over the past couple years with Monte Carlo and how we're applying their technology to improve our insights today. So just a little brief introduction to NASDAQ. Uh, most people probably know that NASDAQ is an exchange operator in the US, but it might surprise you that we actually operate over 30 different marketplaces around the globe, primarily focused in North America and the Nordics. On top of that, we are also a, a, one of the largest uh, providers of financial technology to other market operators and, and financial institutions around the world. That includes over 130 marketplaces globally and over 2,200 financial institutions around the, around the globe as well. So let's talk a little bit about what NASDAQ really does with its information after it comes off the matching engine. And there's really a couple areas we can break this down into. First one is more obvious for most people, regulatory reporting, right? It's a big part of it being a regulated business. We have to provide all types of insights and reporting to all types of agencies to make sure we're in compliance. Another big use case for data is around surveillance, making sure that the market is behaving correctly and in accordance with, with law and making sure that we're identifying any bad faith actors or bad actors early and as quickly as possible. Third, we use it for our own client reporting or insights, right? We are looking at the behavior of our clients, looking at how we can target different segments of the market, entice new order flow, bring in different participants, and really understand how we can monopolize on different market conditions to, to optimize revenue or market share. And then finally is really driving our own key business insights uh, beyond that, right? So getting a, a 360 view of customers, not just within trading, but what else are they doing with our company, right? As I mentioned, we do sell technology to some of these uh, financial institutions. So we want to know the impact to them overall, not just what they're doing on the trading side. So when we think about challenges within data management or monetization in, in the modern era, uh, it's often easy to think about these things at the lowest level of the platform, right? Most of us here are probably data engineers or software engineers of some kind. And most of the time when we think about monitor, uh, modernization of the data platform, we start at the lowest level. So we think uh, you know, data lake, uh, warehouse, how we're storing that information, how we're ingesting that information. But we often overlook the business needs in terms of the modernization challenges as well. How are they going to access that data? How are they going to monetize that data? But underpinning that entire problem is how do they trust that data? Even if you have access to all the information within your data lake or in your data ecosystem, if you can't trust it, it's no good. And that's really where uh, the data observability platform Monte Carlo is coming to help us a lot. So with that being said, kind of try, NASDAQ's view of trying to answer this modernization challenge, we have what is called the intelligence platform. And the intelligence platform is really uh, an effort that has taken over a decade for us to reach where we are at today. We've been operating within AWS as, as a cloud native uh, solution around data since 2013. We go back to when Redshift was first launched. That's how far we've been, or how long we've been running. And we've kind of added on since then, right? So we started, like I just said, at the lowest level. How do we collect all the information? How do we efficiently store that information? And we've moved up the stack to where we are at now with the insights management suite where we deliver product for business users to get access to it. Not only that, we are at the point now uh, where we are actually looking to provide this solution to other market operators around the globe as part of our market technology offering. So other market operators and financial institutions do not have to build or put this together themselves. So just breaking down some of the numbers behind the insights or the intelligence platform, uh, since we've launched this, we have had a 75% reduction in time to market with new reports or insights. In addition, on our own de internal deployments, we have roughly 2,200 users leveraging the reporting product or the insights product. And we generate roughly six to 10,000 reports per day, which for some, it may not seem like a lot, but it's a, it's a decent amount of churn that you have to go through each day and they have to meet, meet their SLAs, right? So just taking you through a bit of a timeline, as I mentioned, we, we've been in the cloud since 2012. We started with a regulatory reporting uh, product. It didn't go so well. Uh, we were a bit ahead of the time in terms of selling that as a service, and we've kind of transitioned to solving our own use cases from there. As I mentioned, we focused on uh, launching a cloud solution data platform to start with in 2013. As you can see, we've kind of moved all the way across, and more recently, we've launched the intelligence platform for non-NASDAQ markets, and at the end of this year, into next year, we're actually going to start launching this for 
non-NASDAQ markets in production. So we've, we've made progress in that area. So with all that being said, what is data observability? What does it mean? This is the Gartner definition of what it is. But just to kind of distill it down, what data observability means is really monitoring your data end-to-end -end in, in your distributed environment. It is understanding both the quality of that data, th about the lineage and the impact of that data, and the financial cost of that data being down. So if you think about this on a road, right, most people can easily start with data quality. And that's where most people should start, right? Basic testing of the information, the, understanding the, the shape, understanding the consistency of it, understanding if it's being loaded and available in time. Those are things that everyone should start with. But where data observability starts separating itself is doing that over time, right? Data in production and in the wild doesn't stay static. What you're doing today is not going to be relevant maybe six months from now. And that's where data observability really shines in that it provides the mechanisms to continuously monitor what is going on and adjust as your data adjusts over time. So what does data observability look like in your workflows? If you kind of think about this, you can detect, triage, resolve, and measure. Detect. Data freshness. Is it, is it loaded in time? Data volume. Does it make sense? If I'm expecting a table to have a million records per day and it only loads 100, you might have a problem. Schema. Schema changes happen, right? Has something changed? How is it impacting your pipelines? Quality, field health, values, all those things happen, right? And you want to make sure that the data you're getting is what you expect. But once you detect an issue, it's important to be able to triage it, right? Understanding the impact, data lineage, what reports, what insights, what is the impact to your customers? Assigning ownership and communicating that information to the owner of that asset so they understand what is going on and they can help resolve the issue. And the final two steps is really around resolution. How do you fix the data or the code or the system and get yourself back online quickly? And then be able to measure that. I think oftentimes measurement is the last thing most people miss in this area. And this has always been a funny topic for me. Uh, as someone who's been uh, in the data landscape for over a decade, when we talk about system uptime, we always talked about how uh, is your system running? Is your data ingestion ingesting data? Is your ETL job running? But we never talked about the uptime in terms of the data itself, right? We never sat there and said, hey, I loaded data, but is it right? And I think that's a key miss that we've made in the data ecosystem for a long time. And that's where I think a tool like Monte Carlo and the data observability space can really help drive us into the future. So let's just lay out a little bit about data observability at NASDAQ. What you see here is an example of a uh, revenue volume dashboard for, uh, for our post-trade system. And it's nothing, nothing fancy, but it has some revenue numbers and some volume, some things that, it, that an executive wants to be able to take a quick look at and get an understanding about their business. This is something that happens way too often, or has happened way too often. One of our business users comes in, looks at the dashboard, and says, month to date revenue looks wrong. I have a details file from the accounting team, and your numbers are way off. Now, the old me would say, well, that seems like the accounting team's problem, not my problem. They probably made the mistake. Uh, but you know, that's not necessarily the right answer. So how do you start thinking about this when someone does show up with a problem? You start asking questions, right? Is the data up to date? In other words, did it load? What does the data look like? Did it change? The definitions change over time. Uh, is something wrong in the value, right? Field health, in my ex if I usually get a range of 0 to 10 and there's 100 in there, is that right or wrong? These are all things that you start thinking about when you get someone showing up with an issue in their data. So, and it's oftentimes hard to answer that if you don't have the right tools to, to do it, right? You might just start looking for the needle in the haystack and hoping you find it. And that's really where Monte Carlo has helped plug in for us, right? It is really plugged and became the uniform platform for all of our data processing from ingest all the way to data preparation and output, right? So we look at the data as it's coming in, making sure it's loading consistently. We look at the shape of that data. We look at the volume of that data. When we do our data transformations, we're monitoring our pipelines. Beyond that, we're also doing field health monitoring on key metrics so we understand when ranges are wrong. We're looking for duplications or null values. These are all things we are able to do and leverage within the Monte Carlo observability platform, right? So as I said, we can detect, resolve, and prevent issues much quicker than we did previously prior to having, bringing Monte Carlo into our ecosystem. So how do we actually deploy Monte Carlo is, is another interesting thing. So we actually run a pretty traditional data lake setup. 
But the way we have it is we have a central uh, ingestion account where we ingest all of the NASDAQ market's information and store it once. And then we essentially allow others to bring their own query tools into those different, into that uh, S3 bucket and hook up so they can actually get access to that information. And what we've kind of come up with is, is a, a multiple step approach in how we deploy Monte Carlo across those, those spectrum, right? So we have what we call our shared monitors, which are pointing to our common Redshift endpoint. That's doing things more like schema detection and, and volume metrics to make sure we're loading the data on time. And then we start looking at application-specific monitors, right? So the analytical Amazon Redshift endpoint is looking for our DBT jobs running and making sure that our DBT models are coming out with the right metrics and, and uh, information. And then the other critical thing we look at is actually our billing endpoint, right? Uh, how we collect revenue, how we are making sure we're actually billing people accurate is a pretty big deal for us. There's regulatory uh, oversight to that. So we have to make sure it's accurate. And that's the other big area we've applied to Monte Carlo to at this point. So just kind of going through a couple things that we've, we've been able to catch with Monte Carlo. And I put this deck together a month ago. And I don't have one of the more recent examples. Um, but we've been able to catch intraday loads that weren't occurring correctly or on time. And we were able to resolve them intraday instead of waiting until the next day when the billing room was going to occur. Right, so that saves, that saves us roughly eight hours of development time or operations time and reprocessing that data. We were able to detect duplicate information in a data set so that we weren't misbilling or miscalculating billing and we were able to prevent the billing run and correct before we did that. Again, saving development and operations time. And then one of the other interesting ones is we only recently started applying this to our billing endpoint, but we actually found an issue in billing. Uh, it was missing, missing data. The way we do versioning is we use views on top of that information. So we apply views to all these various Redshift endpoints. And what we didn't realize is we hadn't applied that view change to the billing endpoint. But the only reason we caught it was because on our common endpoint, we saw that there was a schema change. And that's the first thing we looked like, hey, did we actually apply the view update to that data? And that led us to resolving the issue in minutes instead of hours and trying to dig through what was actually going on there. That actually occurred after I put this deck together. Otherwise, I would have uh, put that one on there. So with that being said, I just want to open it up to, to Q&A questions and, and see if there's any, uh, any information anyone wants. Or, uh... No? All right, then. So if you have any other questions, I encourage you to check out Monte Carlo at Booth 667. I'll be over there at, for a little bit. And then I'm also around for the rest of the day. If you uh, have any questions, feel free to uh, reach out. Thank you very much.